everyone, and welcome to Stedicom's presentation here at the Things Conference Embedded. My name is Marius Winsler, responsible for marketing here at Stedicom, and we are happy to provide you insights on the regulatory approval in the EU with the generic note today. And um, therefore, I would like to introduce um, Stedicom's managing director, Markus Ritter, to you, who will guide you through today's presentation. Before we actually start with the content, I would like to give you a brief overview about um, today's agenda. So after a short introduction about the whole topic, we start with the um, regulatory approval topic um, of the generic notes, and we start with the EMC testing, then go over the radio testing, and last but not least, have a look at the electrical safety testing, and then close with um, a short summary. So that's what we are going to do in the next um, roughly 30 minutes. Um, and not to lose any time, we would like to start with our presentation. And therefore, I hand over to Markus Ritter. So warm good morning, good afternoon, or even good evening, wherever you, we um, reach out to you today right now. My name is Markus Ritter. Marius, thanks. Thank you very much for the uh, for the introduction here. Um, our topic today would be regulatory approval for radio products in the EU, especially short-range device regulatory approval. And um, as an example, we're proud to be able to use data of um, the generic node, um, the generic node, the device from the Things Network. So this tiny little device here being connected to many, many networks already. And uh, yeah, we had a chance to, to look at the insights here and we're proud to be able to present them. But first of all, please let's start with the general introduction regarding radio equipment directive and um, the requirements um, coming from that, being derived from that, um, getting into EMC testing, EMC radio testing, radio testing itself, and also giving a brief overview about electrical safety requirements um, that come from the Radio Equipment Directive. So the introduction itself. Um, in general, anyone producing a radio device, um, bringing it into the market, needs to declare um, conformity according to the Radio Equipment Directive. So this usually has been done by a DOC, Declaration of Conformity, and with that you declare your product being compliant to whatever the regulation gives, and we give you a short overview about what is to be declared here. Um, in general, the conformity assessment assessment meaning the conformity testing depends on the product itself, on, um, on how this product has been built, does it have a plastic housing, um, how many radio interfaces are integrated and so on. And um, this gives in the end the applicable procedure and um, the additional relevant directives like EMC directive and low voltage directive um, to be declared and to be tested during regulatory approval. So looking into Article 3.1 of the Radio Equipment Directive, one would see that whenever I have a product coming with a radio interface, I also need to do EMC testing. So this EMC, Electromagnetic Compatibility Directive, EMCD 2014-30EU, is referenced under Article 3.1 in red. So with that, it must be respected. Of course, radio testing is required. and devices in general having supply voltage more than 50 volt fall under the low voltage directive. In case of a radio device, this voltage limit does not apply and whatever supply voltage your radio product comes with, you need to conduct safety testing. So Come into Article 3.2 in the RED, so people knowing more about Radio Equipment Directive know that we left out quite a bunch of information here, as the uh, Radio Equipment Directive is quite a book, quite a read, um, having very much 
input very much information but we wanted to keep this short and efficient here so let's let's get to the very basic information we need here and very basic information we need for the upcoming test so in order to ensure that radio equipment uses radio spectrum effectively and supports the efficient use of radio spectrum radio equipment should be constructed so that in case of a transmitter transmitter meaning your device does only send it does not receive something it generates radio waves that do not create harmful interference so whatever your device emits it must not conflict with other devices also sending um, so this uh, this means for example if you're if you're using a bluetooth mouth and uh, maybe a bluetooth keyboard in parallel those two must not conflict with each other in case of a receiver it has a level of performance that allows it to operate as intended so if your device also receives it may receive it must receive the necessary information it's been designed for and it must not be influenced by anything else that is probably transmitting on on the used channel here just as a note effectiveness means we're doing the right things and efficiency we're doing the things right so efficiency means for example the polite spectrum usage and so on Effectiveness means, yes, we're sending on 868 megahertz whatsoever, just to make sure effectiveness and uh, efficiency are not being mixed up. Getting into Article 3.3, and um, at least for me, this is the most interesting article as um, this leaves room for future improvement, let's say. So whatever is green marked here is already in place some of these items enf are in place since well, i think it was january time frame this year so very short term ones but in general so let's start with a the radio equipment interworks with accessoires in particular with common chargers so this means whatever comes in for example mobile mobile device like a, a mobile phone they have this USB-C charger in future already been in place. Radio equipment interworks via networks with other radio equipment, meaning so your device is as compatible working to other networks as it could be. Radio equipment can be connected to interfaces of the appropriate type throughout the union, means the European Union. Radio equipment does not harm the network causing unacceptable degradation of services so it could be if you have a device sending permanently and blocking other devices out of the channel radio equipment incorporates safeguards to ensure that personal data privacy of the user and the subscriber are protected so this is in the direction of cybersecurity already also radio equipment supports certain features of ensuring protection from fraud and now it gets interesting. Radio equipment supports certain features ensuring access to emergency services. Um, this is going to be set live in April this year. And it especially means that the E112 function for mobile phones is, is getting ready and um, manufacturers need to comply to this. So this is more or less the same as we have with the e-call service in current automotive um, connections where the um, car itself calls an uh, emergency base emergency central and um, gives okay there's an accident um, maybe given how many people are in the car location and so on so this in future also works with the mobile phone um, a LoRa device is not being requested to um, to call any emergency service here just to make that clear um, but in general this is article 3.3 of radio equipment directive it does not apply to LoRa devices here Disability is a is a um, is another feature that gets live in April, and um, here in um, point I we have that um, the device itself is protected against usage of um, firmware that is not compliant. But this is future. Um, this will more or less mid of this year, as I understand this correctly. Let's get into the testing and out of the specification. Let's start with the EMC testing. As we said in the very beginning, we do this with the example of the generic node. Sorry. So in general, if we're talking about radio EMC, anyone has in mind the EN301489, and then we need the basic standard, which, which is dash one. 
um, standard for radio equipment and services, part one, common technical requirements. And in terms of a short range device, we're talking about 301-489-3, um, which is for specific condition for broadband data transmission systems um, that also includes short range devices. Looking into the dash free standard in detail, we can see that we have first emission to be tested, second immunity to be tested. Emission, in general, it has been done radiated and we have immunity phenomenons to be to be tested and we do these um, radiated and conducted. Um, on the very right hand, one can see in semi-anechoic chamber here, it's a Citicom's semi-anechoic chamber with five meter measurements distance. Uh, we have built up in Düsseldorf just to make sure, okay, we have a conducted floor, we have an height adjustable antenna, and we have absorbers on wall and ceiling. Um, for testing emission, first of all, the general standard 55032, is set in. Um, we're talking about either um, commercial limit, meaning three volt. No, sorry, this is um, immunity level. Emission level is um, 30 dB microvolt per meter, um, respectively 37 dB microvolt per meter. Coming to that later. And in terms of immunity, EMS, electromagnetic susceptibility, we've been testing electrostatic discharge, ESD. Um, according to the basic standard EN 6130-4-2, um, having contact discharge and having air discharge in different kind of voltage levels. For radiated immunity, we're talking about um, 3 volts per meter or 10 volts per meter, depending on where the device in the end has been operated, whether it's... Um, in household and, and uh, commercial or whether it's industrial. Household commercial is three volts per meter, industrial is 10 volts per meter. The standard is um, um, 61,000-4-3. Um, taking this to the very beginning, the device being tested here, just making sure, remembering it's uh, <laughs> the generic note again, it complies, but we want to look into the results in detail. So first we can see emission testing. Emission testing here, it's been started with 30 megahertz and it's been shown up up to one gigahertz. You can see here the limit line starting 30 dB microvolt per meter. Here we have a uh, bandwidth um, limit increasement that sets up to 37 dB microvolts per meter, which is according to class B. The line here, the, the values, the amplitude values are real values. These are real values that have been tested here at Citicom's uh, premises with the generic node. And you can see um, that the device complies. Everything here is below the limit up to one gigahertz. We can see the operating frequency here, which is close to 868 megahertz. Um, even here, it's below the limit. Going into higher frequencies, so depending on the um, on the on the standard uh, for short range devices, that one here was tested up to six gigahertz, and we can see the um, amplitudes also in that area. And still, we can see it complies. Yes, we can see some um, amplitudes here. We can see some peaks, some maxima, and we can also see the values. So, for example, at 3.4 gigahertz, we can see a limit of um, uh, 54, we have a margin here um, being left of, of 355. We can see the antenna height here is fixed in that case of one meter. We can see the polarization and so on. Um, so this has been done with every single device that has been tested. Um, in this case, from, from short range devices um, um, uh, variety. And um, as long as the device complies to these, um, the first test has been passed. And this was what, what we've been showing before here. Um, in the summary, EMI phenomenon radiated interference field strength, that one complies, it is passed. Going into interference testing, respectively susceptibility testing, uh, we want to first concentrate on ESD, electrostatic discharge. Um, this is a picture of the device and we added some markers here, the green and the red markers. 
The green points are contact discharge, meaning the ESD gun has been directed to these points and it's contact discharge. And we have so-called air discharge. These are the red points here, those four, um, where the um, uh, device is, um, yeah, let's say, harmed by um, the ESD pistol being held um, a few, don't know, millimeters up to a centimeter above, and then the ESD impulse is, uh, is started. Um, you can see on the very left side and down the table, below the table, how an ESD impulse looks like. Um, so we have a very short rise time. Um, the maximum voltage is reached here, and then we have a decreasement, a decline of the curve, decline of the voltage up to that. So in total, there's a very short time. Rise time here is, I don't know, in microsecond area. So very short, um, very harsh device. Um, so what is what is the trick in behind? In this rising edge here, we have very many frequencies according to uh, Fourier. And this is why the device really is tested according to interference stability um, with ESD testing. Um, we can see the reaction of the EUT, so device under test. Results here also passed, but we have plus minus two kilovolts. We have plus minus four kilovolts. Um, plus minus six and plus minus eight is not required for contact discharge, but is required for air discharge. And we use directly eight plus minus eight kilovolts. So one pulse has been used in positive direction. One pulse has been used in negative direction. And the device continued to, um, to operate. So reaction of DUT, no loss of LoRa communication. So the device still worked. This is a plastic housing. Um, the way this impulse takes inside the device usually depends on the way of the lowest impedance. And this cannot be predicted anyhow. So one could use like um, ESD diodes inside to, um, to be able to um, conduct the over voltage to, um, to any ground connection or whatever. Um, but in the end, especially if we have a plastic housing, um, no, one, no one could tell. Um, those green points, um, those are the screws of the housing and um, they definitely conduct the voltage to, you know, <laughs> to whatever they touch inside. Um, ESD in general could be, could be um, said that um, the user um, is the crucial point here. The user is the one having the high potential, having like four kilovolt, two, six, eight kilovolt of, of electrical potential. And once the user touches a device, this voltage is being reduced to you know, more or less zero. And this requires some, some current flowing inside the device and this could harm the device. So this in general is ESD testing. The, generic node here passed and we just wanted to show up, okay, what happened. Also naming, it is 10 single impulses at each test point and for each test voltage. So it's not a one-time shot, it's 10 shots per voltage and per polarity. Getting into radiated immunity. Radiated immunity, that one is also tested here at Silicon facilities. You can see the device here being on the table. Um, we use an antenna, we use an electrical field strength, a homogeneous E field of three volts per meter. And this three volts per meter is being applied to the device between 80 megahertz up to six gigahertz. And the device must not react. So we usually have um, a concentrator, a gateway being connected to a LoRa device, talking about LoRa device, and the communication must be up and running. Um, whatever polarization, um, whatever device orientation, so the table is a turntable, it can turn 360 degrees. Um, the antenna is fixed in height here, um, but it can turn from um, vertical to horizontal polarization. Device passed, three volt per meter is no problem. We also did additional tests with 10 volt per meter, especially in the lower frequency area, it also passed. So this just an, as, as an example here. Coming to the radio testing, um, 
Radio testing, looking into the standard. Standard is ETSI-EN 300-220-2, and one could see those 18 tests. Um, 18 tests is not fully correct for a standard LoRa device. We can show this in the next picture here. Those tests are usually not applicable for typical LoRa equipment. So it's those eight here and test number 17 coming out with nine tests that um, have, to be, have to be conducted for typical LoRa equipment. Taking out some of these, um, so this is a fully anechoic chamber. We also have absorbers under the floor here. Um, we've been testing here radiated spurious emissions device in this case here opened. That is also a device mover. It can be rotated. And coming to some results, looking more or less, uh, not equal, but comparable to what we've seen in the EMC testing, but this is radio testing, radiated spurious emissions. First of all, one could see that um, the limit line is different here. Um, Second is that we concentrate on the harmonics of the carrier frequency, carrier frequency in that case, ISM band 868 megahertz. And we, sorry, we can see the harmonics here. And harmonics are being tested. For example, this is um, 3.472 gigahertz um, coming out with a respective peak. Even if that peak is below the limit, limit here is minus 30 dBm. Uh, next one is um, 4.34 gigahertz, also having a limit, limit much closer to, sorry, amplitude much closer to the limit here, and another one at 5.2. That one has also been done up to 6 gigahertz. Um, talking about an FCC radio testing, it would be run to the 10 harmonic. 10 harmonic would be in the area of 9 gigahertz, so FCC would be tested higher. Also, this complies just to make sure you've seen something um, of the radio testing of the generic node. Next test, unwanted emission in the spurious domain. So this concentrates on the carrier, on the carrier frequency itself. Carrier frequency here, that is the low channel, TX low channel, that is TX high channel. So that is um, close to 865 uh, megahertz, that is 868 megahertz. And one could see that we here have um, unwanted, unwanted emission, but it's below the limit, so it's not critical. But anyhow, just to demonstrate, it can look like this one. And if that hits the limit or is above the limit, um, that would require the test to be yeah, updated. That would require the hardware to, to be changed, software to be changed, whatever is needed to, to get that um, amplitude lower here. So that is quite harsh, and we've seen many devices not not being uh, compatible here, not passing, not complying to the requirements out of that testing. Um, in this case, uh, we have a margin of 16 dB. Um, that is quite fine. Coming to radiated power. Um, radiated power has also been tested here. So um, one could see the carrier frequency. Um, taken here, um, setting the limit, limit is 14 dBm, so with a um, short uncertainty or small uncertainty, we've, we've expecting here um, radiated power, and this test case was 2.5 dBm. Um, for the high channel, we found out it's uh, 2.486 dBm, um, also very important, um, especially talking about um, European regulations where in this ISM band 14 dBm must not be exceeded for any short range device. Occupied bandwidth is also something that uh, comes from the efficient spectrum use. And if I want to, um, yeah, <laughs> be really efficient here and coming out saying, okay, my, my occupied channel bandwidth is 125 kilohertz, then you need to prove that you use 125 kilohertz and not 126 or something. Um, so you can see those markers here, T1, T2, and you can see here directly occupied bandwidth, OBW, 125 kilohertz. And in this case, respectively for the low and for the high channel, um, this is very well met, so occupied bandwidth is fine. 
Um, we also seen testing where this uh, occupied bandwidth was 125.8 dot something, and this is not fine. This is not in the um, direction of efficient um, usage of spectrum. This has also been tested under different kind of um, temperatures. So T nominal, temperature nominal is 25 degrees Celsius. The minimum temperature is minus 10 degrees and T max is plus 55. So these two temperatures we get from our customers, in that case from uh, Things Network Conference, telling us, okay, um, this device will also be used used outdoors and the specified minimum temperature is minus 10, the outdoor maximum specified temperature is plus 55. And we're testing this over the different kind of frequencies with the minimum voltage and the maximum operating voltage. So nominal voltage is 3.3, minimum is two volts, maximum is 5.5, and it needs to show um, the same occupied bandwidth, it needs to show the same carrier um, we did before, and you can here also see that this one has been passed. Let's get into a very short excurse into electrical safety testing. Um, until now, we've been uh, we've been showing examples from the generic node. Um, now we're getting into a bit more of standard of the six to 368-1 standard, as this is, yeah, it's not new anymore, but it's still, it's not run in, let's say. Many, many have, have been testing according to 6950-1 in the past, and 6950-1, it is outdated meanwhile, and 62368 is, um, yeah, it's not the new standard, but it's a current valid standard to be used here. Um, main difference is 62368-1 is a hazard-based safety engineering standard and hazard in that case means we have an energy source that exceeds body susceptibility limits, meaning, okay, many of you may have known that um, voltages over 40 volts can lead to like heart rays, like um, uh, rhythm issues with the, with the heart and um, so just just giving an example. So a safe situation in that case means that we have safeguards interposed between the human body and a hazardous energy source. And these could be like electrical, like chemical, thermal, so heat, mechanical, or even radiation as hazard source. And um, the energy transfer is based on the amount of energy and the effectiveness of the transfer mechanism. So, for example, if the housing of your device is quite hot and you may burn your, your finger touching it, um, then it, it could be, could be uh, safe having something in between your finger and the housing. So, the effectiveness of the transfer mechanism is also quite crucial. Inju injury occurs when energy of sufficient magnitude and duration is imparted to a body part. If we're talking about microseconds and a very hot surface, it will not harm anyone. If we're talking about minutes and a very hot surface, it will. So just giving you the general diagram here. So we have a hazardous model and we have a safety model. Safeguards are quite required. The 62368 is a product safety standard. It defines users and body parts. It defines energy sources. It defines its classes and it describes and provides guidance for safeguards against energy sources, and it advises tests that qualifies the safeguards as being effective, effective once more. So first we have different kind of persons, ordinary persons. So I usually talk in that case about my grandma. My grandma is an ordinary person, not knowing how to, how to treat any device. We have instructed person. These are persons that have been trained, skilled persons, like someone did a training for these. And we have very skilled persons that are trained and have experience. Maybe people work in a laboratory, for example. They are able to take appropriate precautions, should be protected from unexpected habits. Of course, also, um, this is the same as applying to my grandma as an ordinary person. So electrical energy 
can lead to pain, fibrillation, cardiac, uh, cardiac arrest, respiratory arrest, skin burn, or internal organ burn. It could be, um, as said in the very beginning, so voltage, respectively current surges away of um, the lowest impedance, and this could lead to internal organ burn. We have electrical power energy leading to fire, electrical caused fires leading to burn related pain or injury and property damage. Chemical injury, I think I do not need to go into detail here. Kinetic energy, um, thermal energy or radiated energy, um, also not applying to a standard device like a generic node. So we have different kind of classes. Class one, under normal operating conditions, and abnormal operating conditions. The energy in contact with the body part may be detectable, but is not pain, painful, nor it is likely to cause an injury. So talking about a free volt supply for a device, not having any special functionality, usually that energy source would be class one. Coming to a safeguard, I gave the example in the very beginning, having, for example, a very hot housing the housing might be coated with something that um, prevents um, anyone from, from touching the housing itself, being burned, being um, re receiving receiving any pain from that. That that is a safeguard. Um, if a device is being used outdoors, if we're if we're in contact with spray water, for example, um, the device may be um, coming with a um, with the lubrication or something, with with any kind of, of rubber addictive to prevent um, any electrics inside getting in touch with the spray water outside. So mechanisms of safeguards, they usually treat, um, yeah, they, they help the user to, to being prevent, um, uh, preventing causing pain or injury. Um, it usually attenuates the energy, it reduces the amplitude, the value. So given devices working with 230 volts, um, then what can be seen outside is being reduced to below 40, for example, impeding the energy, so slowing the rate of energy transfer, diverting the energy, um, changes the energy direction, like an internal reflector for something, heat, for example. It disconnects like a fuse, it interrupts, envelopes the energy source or interposes a barrier between a body part and the energy source. So safeguard, I think it's it's quite logical. It's, it's self-explaining more or less, and it just depends on, okay, what kind of hazard do I expect? Finally, showing the way to identify whether energy source is hazardous or not. First, identify a source. We gave several examples about electrical, um, power sources, chemical, mechanical, heat, or radiated sources. Um, is it hazardous? Yes. Identify means by which energy, energy can be transferred to a body part. Then design a safeguard which will prevent energy transfer to a body part. Measure safeguard effectiveness, like testing cases, maximum temperature. Is it effective, yes or no? Otherwise, safeguard needs to be redesigned. Giving you some limits also, we've been asked by many people, okay, what is what is the limit? I have to, I have to um, bear in mind here, energy sources, limit that is okay, limit that is mm, not, not that okay and that is harmful here. Um, giving you some examples, DC 60 volts is fine. DC 120 volts hmm, needs to be respected, and above that definitely needs to be respected. If we're talking about AC, um, it's only 30 volts RMS or 50 volts RMS, and especially for peak, um, it's it's uh, even different. If we're talking about current in terms of, uh, instead of voltages, so current is uh, much more, let's say, uh, harmful is, is a wrong word, but needs to be respected in a different way and you can see the limits below. So just make sure you know what you're doing, you know about those energy sources in your device, 
um, you know what the usual way to use your device is and you also know what the abnormal usage of your device could be like operating with open housing or something yeah so that was a very very rough introduction to the um, electrical safety testing i hope that the introduction to the emc and radio testing was a bit more in detail and more interesting for you especially in terms of the generic note and um, if there are any questions on your side please feel free to contact us here at citycom and we will take care of those questions Maris. yeah thank you very much so um yeah as uh, marcos Ritter said um please um, if there are any questions coming up, any any kind of items you would like to have clarified afterwards, feel free to get in touch with us um, at contact at .com. We are more than happy to reply to, to any kind of questions. And um, yeah, at this stage, we would like to thank you for your participation at um, today's event. Um, and we hope that you enjoyed our presentation and um, we wish you um, all the best and um, a great event with the with the upcoming um, other presentations. Um, stay safe and uh, yeah, from from Sericom side, thank you very much. Thank you and goodbye.